I think we can start. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mikhail Levin, and I'm the director of the Moscow School of Contemporary Art. Uh, first of all, um, there is a Russian translation, so if anyone needs to listen to our talk in Russian, uh, you can uh, choose in the Zoom webinar the channel for uh, the uh, to listen to Russian. Um, uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce my dear colleagues who joining us today for this talk. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you all for uh, for the fact that you actually agreed to to be with us today. Um, John Kay is. Um, is our course leader for foundation art and design, and he is working with us for the third year. He is a really well-known British artist and curator. John, hi. Hi, Mikhail. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Teasdale uh, is a former BA Fine Art course leader and the head of research at the Leeds College of Art and also a very well-known British artist. And uh, he was one of the first uh, students on a basic course at Leeds in the beginning of the 60s. And uh, Jeff is gonna share his uh, memories and his, uh, um, ex what he experienced during that time. So hopefully we're gonna have a chance to talk about that. Jeff, thank you very much that you're joining us Welcome. today. Um, Doug Bowen is also our colleague here at the British High School of Art and Design, and uh, he's a courseway, uh, pathway leader for communication design on foundation. Hi, Doug. And also he's an artist. Misha. Hello. Hi. Um, Daya Sarokina is an art historian, educator, and tour guide, uh, she works at the ba Bauhaus Daisao Foundation. And she's also one of the co-curators of the exhibition Futumas 100 Years, the School of Avant-Garde, which just recently opened at the uh, Museum of Moscow. Hi, Daria. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Um, Aliona Sakolnikova. Uh, she's an independent curator, researcher, and uh, lecturer in design history. She's a founder of the Design in Details project, and uh, she's also co-curator of the exhibition of Futumas. Aliona, hi. Hi, thank you for the invitation. And uh, Ksenia Yefimova, she's our ex-student of uh, foundation course and uh, she's a practicing very promising and talented designer so Xenia thank you for joining um, so again thank you very much that you all gathered today here in this new format of our reality in zoom and uh, actually it's very interesting because we're talking from really different places so Moscow, England, and Germany. So this is great. This is definitely a positive thing that we can pick up from uh, new conditions that we all have been into. Um, I'm gonna shortly introduce the context of our discussion and then I'm gonna hand over to our speakers. So I'm not gonna take much time. So today's theme, is uh, about Futumas legacy. We're gonna talk about uh, British foundation courses and uh, we're gonna make the links to the kind of educational avant-garde practices that were established in the beginning of the 20th century at Futumas and also at Bauhaus. Um, 
uh, well, I would probably like to show some images before we're going to go into the discussion of, uh, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, uh, so you can actually, hopefully you can see it. So this is a first image and it demonstrates uh, what we have put together with the foundation team with Sean Duck and our other colleagues recently, two weeks ago, at uh, our space uh, at the Vinzavod. Uh, uh, the space is actually an initiative, a joint initiative between Moscow School of Contemporary Art, British High School of Art and Design, and uh, uh, also a blip, blip, blip project. It's a curatorial project, which was initially found by Sean and his colleague, Harry Midley, in Leeds uh, about eight years ago. And uh, now uh, we have reestablished it here in Moscow. And uh, this was the opening project. Uh, the exhibition is called Foundation uh, 100 Years After Futamas. And it also makes a link to the uh, exhibition that I already mentioned, which has recently opened at the Museum of Moscow and Daria and Alona are co-curators of that show. So uh, for us, it was important to show the kind of roots and practices that uh, now are um, kind of uh, what we what we try to kind of implement and what we do with the students, but I'm not going to go into details right now. I think Sean would be much better person to talk about those things. I'm just going to say that uh, for our school and for the exhibition space that we just established, it was a really important thing to start with something something of that kind to actually show where our roots are and to make that link to the uh, Futimas practices. Um, also, uh, uh, I would probably like to say that, um, you know, for us being uh, here in uh, Moscow, at the British Higher School of Art and Design, it's it's very important that we uh, try and implement those international practices in art and design education, and that's why uh, we uh, trying to uh, kind of not create something from the scratch, but actually make an international links and to kind of move educational practices forward and uh, uh, help our students integrate into the kind of global context. Um, so the centenary of Futimas, which is celebrated in uh, 2020, is, uh, is an important date. And uh, the exhibition that um, was put together by us and also by the Museum of Moscow is something to indicate the uh, very important role that Futimas played in the history of uh, uh, art and design and uh, what kind of um, important things were found in terms of uh, you know, modern art, design, architecture, textile, and so on. Um, arguably, and this is something that we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, the legacies of Hutumas is that kind of really new experimental uh, approach to uh, education in art and design. And uh, we we are suggesting that uh, those links are then been found in uh, in UK, especially in the in the kind of establishment of foundation courses. Uh, during the 1920s, uh, Futimas and Bauhaus, of course, exchanged ideas and exchanged uh, scholars and educators. 
and they uh, set up their courses as a kind of uh, like a base and uh, all students were required to complete as a kind of a vital part of the kind of new teaching method that were developed. And um, then in the uh, beginning in the 50s, as a basic course was developed by Harry Thumborn at Leeds College of Art and uh, Victor Passmore and Richard Hamilton at King's College in Newcastle. But again, I think I'm not uh, uh, an expert and I'm sure Jeff would be able to talk in great detail about those things. So I'm just gonna say that uh, we're gonna try and share our experiences of uh, uh, you know, studying on foundation and studying on uh, uh, British programs uh, in, uh, in UK and also here at uh, British High School of Art and Design in Moscow. And uh, hopefully we're gonna uh, make the links and talk about Putemas and foundation, how it's all connected. So uh, I would like to start by asking Daria about, um, you know, how she thinks, uh, uh, you know, the practices uh, of um, uh, Bauhaus were really uh, connected to Futemas. And um, if we refer to the uh, exhibition Views of Cubism and Abstract Art, which was actually created by Alfred Barr at MoMA in New York in, 1960, in 1966, uh, another colleague of uh, ours, Anna Bokova, uh, who I think is also, um, was a contributing curator for the um, show at the um, Museum of Moscow, uh, uh, she uh, mentioned in her text that Futemas and Bauhaus, uh, they're kind of uh, on common origins and uh, uh, creation with fire. And it was published uh, in the book, Dust and Data, Traces of ba Bauhaus Across 100 Years. Uh, and on the whole, the uh, 1960s, 36 new New York exhibition reflecting back at late 1928 was a testament to the active traffic of artists between Germany and uh, Soviet Russia, and of course between Bauhaus and Putemas. Uh, so, um, Daria, from your position of working for Bauhaus Foundation, could you maybe talk a little bit about the links that existed and uh, uh, those links between artists and educators that established prior to the formation of maybe Bauhaus and Putemas? Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe were those maintained in the years of the schools that uh, they did function? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. I'm honored and pleased to be at this uh, discussion and I absolutely agree with my colleague, our co-curator, Anna Bokova, who recently presented her book about uh, Futemas. Uh, it's uh, mostly about um, architectural education. Uh, but if we say in general about interrelations, uh, there are different ways, uh, like personal and there are very important and big personalities like Elisitsky and Kandinsky. I would put emphasis on them. And it's like, let's say all the generation, like father founders who created the schools uh, later on students and exhibitions. There are big exhibitions like Weissenhof in Stuttgart in 1927 and like uh, uh, SR Contemporary Architecture or Constructivist Exhibition in Moscow where Russian constructivists revealed something about uh, the Bauhaus as a Putemas-like school maybe or constructivist influenced school. But first of all, Kandinsky and uh, Lisitsky. It's a very curious story. Uh, and I think, I believe I, uh, I work with it right now, but as far as I 
observe it's a very underestimated story um, and uh, uh, it's very tangled uh, and they had very uh, you know opposite ways uh, to uh, influence both schools because Elie Sitsky was Malevich's student uh, who indirectly teached at the Bauhaus uh, just like Theo van Duisburg, he had such a weird status of uh, like uh, in, in invited teacher or uh, teacher who gives some maybe workshops, but never, uh, you know, official teacher of the Bauhaus. Yeah? Uh, but he strongly influenced one of the most important Bauhaus teachers like Klaus Lemaholy Nagy who got influenced by Russian constructivists and considered himself as constructivist after uh, the Russian constructivist exhibition in Berlin. And it's a direct and indirect impact in Germany uh, from uh, Russian guy Elisitsky. And after that, he worked in Futamas, yeah, knowing this uh, and having this experience teaching in the Bauhaus in background. And uh, Kandinsky, uh, who actually also Russian, but uh, who was established an, as an artist in Germany and accidentally during the war got back to Russia, married and stayed in Moscow. And uh, he was involved into genesis of new artistic institutions and not only involved, but he was one of the key personalities. He was taking decisions and creating those institutes, including uh, Futamas, uh, including Museum of Artistic Culture and Institute of Artistic Culture. It was uh, just unbelievable because uh, later on, uh, same Alfred Barr founded Museum of Modern Art after visiting Moscow and seeing Museum of Artistic Culture in Moscow. And it's uh, very unfair of him to exclude Frutamas and Russians from his world famous scheme of artistic movements. And uh, actually Kandinsky uh, is a weird uh, personality in this context because uh, he wasn't um, uh, into you know, revolutionary activities uh, because people around him like uh, Popova, uh, like uh, Rochenko and many, many others, yeah, uh, were true, uh, very sincere revolutionaries yeah? and uh, who were strongly involved into the new ideology. And Kandinsky always tried to stay away from him, fr from it. Uh, but uh, he was really into uh, new concepts of art. And uh, uh, he, he was the one who was shaping actual uh, educational uh, system. And having this background, he moved to Germany in 1921. He actually uh, joined this very, very important process, this genesis, and transmitted this knowledge to Germany. But it's a very you know, strong straight, uh, statement tr transmitted because at this point, we don't know much. We can say for sure that he was a deputy director from 1922 till 1933 in the Bauhaus. Yeah, so the second person after the director of the school. And uh, we know some conflicts uh, with uh, him and students um, and uh, the second director, Hannes Meyer. But uh, honestly, we don't know much what's, what was happening, how exactly he shaped the education. We just may imagine because he was teaching uh, analytical, analytical drawing, uh, uh, color and form and so on. Uh, but the fact, uh, the world famous curriculum, this, uh, you know, brand of the Bauhaus, this uh, uh, circle, yeah, with the bow at the core, yeah, and the uh, four cores, or so basic courses, the out layer, uh, was presented at the year 1922, when uh, Kandinsky uh, uh, started his teaching in the Bauhaus. And also, it's a very weird and tangled uh, story, because as we all know, no, um, the basic course was uh, presented and it was sort of invention of Johannes Eaton, who left the school at the year 1923 and it transformed uh, and uh, Maholi, um, Laszlo Maholi Nagy and Josef Albers and personalities like uh, Kandinsky and Klee were around. So uh, 
this fact of presence of Kandinsky says for itself, but uh, I think um, to explain how, yeah, uh, in a very precise detail, uh, we have to work hard. I mean, art historians and researchers, we have we still have to reveal this uh, curious and tangled story. And uh, later on, after, uh, let's say, forefathers like Lisitsky and uh, Kandinsky, um, we have uh, mutual visits. At the year 1927, a uh, Russian delegation, including constructivists, architectural constructivists like uh, uh, Maisie Ginsburg, uh, visited Germany and they've been to Dessau. Uh, and after that, a little delegation, uh, three student delegation uh, visited Moscow at the year 1928. Actually, uh, these uh, students are very well known. Maybe you're familiar with uh, Gunter Stölzel, Arie Sharon, and Pierre Buking. The last one, not that famous, uh, but uh, the first two uh, remarkable Bauhaus couple. And Gunter was the first uh, lady uh, to become a new uh, young master of the school. She was head of the weaving uh, department. And uh, uh, we have records what they write about this visit. They were super passionate and they were looking forward to find an opportunity to work in Moscow. And uh, thus, not Gunta herself and not Arya Sharon, but uh, many Bauhaus representatives uh, left Germany, they moved to the Soviet Union in the 1930s, at the year 1930, 1931, and so on. And uh, it's uh, such a dramatic story. And uh, in some literature, I even met an expression as a uh, lost generation. Because uh, I personally know uh, families uh, of uh, Bauhaus students uh, who were exiled, who were blackmailed as uh, fascists who are actually anti-fascists and communists. <laughs> but um, it's a very dramatic story as of, of Hutamas as the school as uh, of this uh, uh, generation. Uh, but uh, there are very intense and uh, very curious facts of communication between the schools. But uh, I put emphasis on Kandinsky who actually uh, really uh, transferred the experience from Russia to Germany. Daria, thank you very much. So we can clearly, well, we share the belief that the uh, links were extremely strong and the exchange was happening throughout the many, many years. Um, Alona, I wanted to ask you uh, about the actual uh, arrangement of Putimas and about so-called core department. So, uh, as I understand, it was a kind of a preliminary course, uh, and um, it, its curriculum. It was a kind of a uh, very radical shift from previous uh, art education that existed. Uh, and uh, as um, uh, Daria already mentioned, uh, the, it was somehow somewhat uh, mirrored at what Bauhaus uh, was happening. And uh, we believe and uh, we, we know that it strongly influenced later the basic design teaching in uh, Britain. Uh, and then later led to uh, uh, foundation program. So uh, maybe you can talk uh, a little bit about the uh, importance of core department and uh, what, what actually was part of the curriculum. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. And uh, I would like to continue uh, the set of comparison that Daria started. Uh, because um, it is also important to mention uh, from the perspective of uh, the foundation of the preliminary course and the whole concept behind Futemas and Bauhaus that both schools were founded um, based on two 
previously existed uh, schools. One was an art school and another was a craft school. So it was a combination of high arts and fine crafts in order to set up uh, the industrial production. So uh, the whole emphasis of on uh, the new visual and material culture that should be done uh, together by artists and craftsmen in collaboration and search for new ways to communicate to and interact with industry. It was at the core of the both schools, as well as a um, quite common from the search of the late 19th, early 20th century, um, a search for universal visual language and, and more, not only visual language, but um, universal principles uh, behind the whole processes. Uh, so it has a, lo a lot of um, connections with uh, many organizational theories and uh, uh, in inside the Russian avant-garde. So it was more a global scientific uh, uh, process and attitude at that time. Uh, so um, first of all, in Futamas, it was a combination of uh, previously purely artistic departments like architecture, uh, painting and sculpture, and they stayed uh, an elite departments inside the school. Most of the students were focused there, while the uh, uh, industry so department, uh, uh, like uh, metalworks, uh, woodworks, um, uh, sculpt, uh, ceramics, and textile, and uh, polygraphic departments that was at the time called graphic departments to step a little bit aside from <laughs> industry and production and to, uh, according to Vadim Pavlovsky, to emphasize its uh, connection with rather high art. Um, all these um, uh, product uh, and industry oriented uh, departments, they were not so popular because um, the final uh, industrial artists that they put it uh, together artists engineers uh there were not so uh, not yet such a place um inside the actual fa factories for them they uh, were looking for new work opportunities new job titles and uh for many of them it only became possible after the second world war <laughs> Uh, finally, to have this um, tight, uh, work title within a factory is to find a, a special place for um, artistic engineering. So, and also there were economical issues so, uh, with new equipment. Alfred Barr also writes about the, the uh, Bauhaus was much, much better equipped. And we know that during the first years of Hutemas, there was still a civil war. And, all the students lived very poorly and uh, they could not buy basic supplementary materials for the course and it was essential for uh, industry departments uh, and also methodological because they started in a workshops uh, that originally belonged to Stroganov um, art school and it was all traditional handicraft workshops so they still were doing engravings and stuff uh, for example, when Rochenko took uh, his uh, first uh, course on metalworks, he gave his students a task to sketch a design for a table clocks. And one of his students uh, drew a um, fantasy house on a bird leg uh, for as a design, a typical example of uh, what kind of craft uh, decorative uh, design they did at the metalworks department. And Rochinka took this sample from Nikolai Sobolev as an example to explain to other students how they're planning to shift uh, towards a new approach uh, uh, of design that it's all about form and function and the way they color correlate together, the way uh, construction uh, reveals uh, the function of an object and should be hided behind a decorative uh, facade. So the, this whole transformation uh, inside the school. But, uh, for, and uh, it is important to see that uh, the ideas behind preliminary course, it was um, uh, created by this young avant-garde uh, uh, teachers who also were members of the INHUK, in Institute of uh, Artistic Culture, uh, co-founded by Vasily Kandinsky before he left to Germany, and um, that they originally were teaching at these artistic departments uh, in um, painting, uh, architecture, and sculpture. And from 
uh, there they started this uh, experiment on the first, uh, during the first year of education, looking for these objective principles of education and new universal language. And from then, uh, uh, starting from 1922, they moved towards the idea of the universal course uh, that will be suited for all students of all departments, no matter which uh, professional pathway will, they will choose in the future. And actually, quite often, after this preliminary course, many students uh, that, for example, um, entered to, to study textile moved to architecture. This We know some such uh, biographical shifts inside the students' biographies. So within this course, they all uh, had a chance to try different disciplines. This is direct links to the foundation course. Um, but uh, with some um, differences and peculiarities uh, that uh, were characteristic for Russian school. Personally, even compared to the Bauhaus uh, uh, first year um, course, I would say that uh, at the certain moment, uh, Kutema's preliminary course was uh, more logically structured. I really liked the way it was divided exactly in four major disciplines in the end, after all, transformations, and uh, how they complemented one each other. So it was a graphic, color, volume, and space. And they were stepping one on each other. And also inside each of these disciplines, there was also a shift from two-dimensional um, experiments towards uh, volumetric. So inside uh, graphics, inside color, inside volume, um, for example, in sculpture, they were moving from uh, almost two-dimensional reliefs to three-dimensional and spatial composition. So it was a great connection between volume and space uh, disciplines. And also in color, they started on the plane and ended up with uh, texture and reliefs and uh, uh, not only in depicting space, but also in um, actually um, working with three-dimensional um, qualities of material and the way and looking at the way it uh, reflects some color. Uh, so, uh, and it was uh, pretty much the way I like uh, to use an example of this scheme that was published uh, by Elisitsky in the uh, first issue of uh, Vish magazine that he was uh, published in Berlin. And there was an article by Theo van Dosberg when he uh, based on the style system that has a lot of parallel with suprematism at the time, he showed that there was a graphical dimension with a couple of black squares painted. Then there is a volumetrical dimension with um, cubes uh, with uh, black shadows. And then there is a spatial uh, direction with uh, only contours of the cubes so, so to represent the architecture. So they were looking for this uh, universal, um, very logical uh, system based on uh, basic forms and with um, within it uh, and, and in order to transform everything from textile to architecture and Futemas actually managed to uh, propose a very revolutionary projects in each of these directions from in textiles and ceramics and then in architecture and you can see some parallels if you look closely enough and also it is important then uh, unlike uh, Bauhaus in Futemas especially in the first years then of course they developed um, um, uh, so an, another course that you have to take in order to be prepared to enter the art school. But during the first years, they took everybody's. Like in Svomas, right after the revolution, the idea was that it's very democratical institution and any person could enter without any specific uh, artistic exam and sometimes without even um, a full education. So teachers had to work with very different students. For example, in Rochenko group, there were students right from the school and students who already finished seven years of the Imperial uh, Acad Academy. So it was very different level. And in order to communicate with these students on the same language and also in order uh, ironically to stay a step outside of the box so to develop this kind of thinking that is also uh, parallel with the uh, foundation I guess but they have to start with basic geometrical shapes <laughs> and uh, it was ironic uh, when um, for the first time a founder of um, a space uh, course the most uh, innovative one in a way uh, Nikolai Ladovsky from an architectural department uh, he had to introduce his first uh, task uh, to the group of academics uh, within the architectural department. 
and the description of the task was uh, you need uh, to draw a um, rectangle in space. <laughs> And it was, it sounded very silly compared to the architectural orders that uh, they did before, but then the whole focus of the space department was absolutely unique because for the first, uh, well, with graphics, color and volume, it was, um, of course, avant-garde, but it was still based on graphics, painting and sculpture and under the supervision of another director of Kutamas, Vladimir Fogorsky, they later shifted to the quite conservative paintings, uh, although with um, a huge uh, sector on um, a theory of color and physics of color and psychology of color, but still they returned more classical paintings, they returned to classical drawings, and they returned more classical approach towards figurative sculpture. But with space, it was something completely different. So this was the discipline that stayed and developed under supervision of uh, Nikolai Wadovsky students the, through the whole 10 years of Hotemas history. And it was the first time when um, we were thinking of about architecture, not uh, as a set of buildings and composition of forms, but we were thinking about the space around them. So the negative space and the idea that the function of architecture is to navigate people in space. So there's a whole new perspective. And in order to develop it, uh, we have to start not from drawings. We have to start from making 3D models right from the scratch. So without any uh, studies on paper, in order to develop this truly amazing um, effect uh, of the famous Russian avant-garde architecture, one of the uh, key secrets behind it is that they started by working with the material and by uh, doing compositions on a certain uh, task in order to achieve balance and other uh, types of composition in space, rhythm, and so on. Um, and I've, uh, there are two interesting uh, things at this point that I find personally exciting, is that, in my opinion, the whole uh, straight behind the uh, Russian avant-garde architecture was that the students who graduated from Hutamas uh, they were all going through these propedeutics by Ladovsky and other uh, courses as well, but they also were influenced by, um, many of them were also influenced by constructivist teachers. And in the end, many of the project, many of the students, they could not tell. Um, so it was, of course, between, there was certain um, uh, quite strong differences between rationalist and constructivist approach. But the students, uh, many of the most successful students, they managed to uh, succeed from both approaches and to integrate them into their personal projects. So they both have this uh, uh, structural purity of constructivist approach, but also they put uh, a human perception and human perspective in an emphasis of many solutions, many ideas. And it gives a very exciting example. And the same happened at the uh, metal and works, woodworks working uh, department that I was creating for the exhibition from a design history perspective, uh, because uh, there was, for example, a metal work department uh, constructivist Alexander uh, Rochenka and his uh, ideas. And then, for example, in 1927, when Vladimir Tatlin came with his ideas of material culture, and he was not quite fitting into this uh, uh, workshop on industry-based uh, material uh, structure of, uh, of Hutemas that was similar to Bauhaus. So he was teaching at uh, metalwork uh, department and woodwork department and also in ceramics department. And he taught uh, students to uh, combine um, advantages of all materials uh, in order to achieve a certain effect. And he was also putting um, interaction with human body, this anthropomorphical approach towards uh, design in the center of his um, approaches. And his um, uh, chairs, for example, produced by his students or ceramics, they step um, aside visually with these uh, biomorphical forms from what constructivists did. But once students, uh, uh, there were students who studied from all these teachers together, in the end, they managed to complement these approaches. And in, I'm, when I was preparing the exhibition, I found a very interesting document that uh, for, although the school was um, uh, reformed in 2013 and practically closed, uh, there was a great plan for 2030 that uh, Tatlin would do a 
not only a material culture as a supplementary course, but the major project courses on both metalwork department and woodwork department, working together with Rochenka and Lisitsky. And we can now only imagine with, uh, which uh, outcomes could we draw from these approaches. So I think these are the basic moments. I can talk <laughs> a lot more, of course, but I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing my, uh, my colleagues and I'm very excited about uh, an opportunity to learn more about the founding stages of uh, foundation course in UK because I only visited an exhibition about uh, uh, Bauhaus uh, in UK, uh, I think about seven um, years ago, and it was a very exciting set of parallels, although it was mostly architectural, but and I'm looking forward to learn more from educational perspective. <laughs> Leona, thank you very much. This was great. And I'm sure that for uh, Jeff, Sean, and Doc, it was exciting to hear all those things. Um, I also need to mention that at our exhibition, we drew visual parallel. And uh, I want to thank the Mahi Museum for loaning us uh, archival images of uh, you know, students and teachers at, at uh, Hutemas that uh, worked on the project. And uh, in the exhibition, we actually put them next to works of our uh, students on foundation and actually visually try to make the comparison and make the links. But I'm sure, again, Sean would probably talk about this. And Sean, you probably want to start uh, yeah, by asking uh, um, Yes? Alone was, was saying that you visited the Bauhaus uh, exhibition seven years ago. Uh, also seven years ago at Tate Britain, there was an exhibition called Basic Design. Uh, and in the catalogue essay um, for that, Beth Williamson states that the influence of the German Bauhaus and its teachers was felt acutely in the mid 20th century British art education, particularly in basic design teaching. And, and Jeff, um, as I understand it, you arrived as a 17-year-old student at Leeds College of Art on the basic design course in 1960. Uh, and this was a new program that was established by the artist Harry Thubron. Um, as students, were you aware of the Bauhaus and Vakutamas? Were these institutions mentioned as part of your teaching at Leeds? Oh, yeah. Not so much Vakutamas, but certainly the Bauhaus. And, and another school, which us movement that's not really been mentioned by your colleagues yet, which is the Dutch one, De Stiel, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where Mont Mondrian, Van Do Kees van Doesburg and others worked, and they influenced both the Bauhaus and I suspect the Koutemass as well. Uh, right? So it, I've just expanded the, uh, the range, as it were, of institutions by introducing De Stiel. Indeed. Which, which actually was found in 1917, so that's the first one. Yeah. Okay. Right? And of course, Mondrian went, changed his name slightly and went to Paris. But uh, Van Doesburg also worked at the Bauhaus. Case Van Doesburg, yeah, Doisburg, right? And so those names were all introduced to us. But not so much as that. Not so much for Kutamas, mm -hmm. right? Could you tell us a little bit about your experience of the basic design course, at least, Jeff? Could, uh, uh, what was the sort of syllabus like? What what sort of projects were you undertaking on the course? Well, it's it's strange how some of the terms that your colleagues have mentioned, the, the previous speakers have mentioned, uh, architecture, constructivist, technology, materials space, volume, color theory, right? We're all present in the language of the basic design course at Leeds. But the strange thing is when students went to the Leeds College of Art, they didn't know that they were going to a basic design course. It was very much the understanding that we would continue doing something that we're good at school at, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the first, I remember the first introduction to it, to the basic design course was that we were going to be de-educated. In other words, preconceptions of what was, we, could, we might have expected at a British art school, or Leeds College of Art in particular, 
would not exist. We had to start again from fresh. It was like a kind of, I don't know, I would just say clean cleansing operation of preconceptions about what art might be and what art might be for. Right? So I'll describe the course here. Uh, I, I suppose the intake at that time would be about maybe 20 students, right? Maybe 25 something like that order. There weren't very many. Uh, and I think Alia mentioned uh, the experience of uh, some students coming from straight from school to the Kutamas and others coming after studying at the Imperial Academy. Their age range was quite different. And that was similar with the intake that I was in. Some of us had started at the age of 16 some had done national service and therefore were about 18, 19. Some had done a sixth form experience, others hadn't. So it was a very mixed experience, pre-college experience. So we arrived, uh, we split into two groups, group A and group B. And this was purely organizational. Group A did one week doing color theory and space division, as they called it. Uh, and group B did three-dimensional work, right? And that alternated throughout the first, throughout the year. So every fortnight he did color and drawing and spatial examination and the alternate fortnight, right? Would be three-dimensional work, particularly sculpture. Um, The exercises themselves uh, were totally new to everybody. Like we were into, uh, if I take color theory, for example, basically around the work of Joseph Albers and Itten, right? And strangely, somebody called, what was his name? Um, anyway, I'll come back to me, somebody from Bradford, who worked in the textile industry in Bradford, who was intriguing about explaining how threads of color in woven textiles could influence each other. So you could make something uh, gray cloth, which in fact was made out of red and green wool mixed together that won't balance the other out. And so from a distance, it looked like it looked like gray, but in fact, it was when it close up, all it sets, a bit like French pointillism, but you know, but, but in woven cloth. Uh, we were given, uh, how shall I say, like a sheet of paper and we had to divide it into a way that worked vertically and horizontally, space division of the paper. Now, this term worked was interesting. It worked or it didn't work, but nobody could explain how one, one student might work and somebody else's and other students might not be working, right? Uh, oh yeah. So the, the uh, cute students, including myself, uh, soon realized what they wanted. The ones that they considered to work looked like this, and the ones that were considered not to work didn't look like that. So everybody did one that looked like that. In other words, everybody's work started working to use this army phrase. And the same with colour exercises. And the colour exercises were done with oil paint, but on paper. Uh, and so the oil in the paint spread out onto the paper and made these most interesting effects, like uh, we, things like, in, it was again from Albers, uh, induced colour, for example, complementary colours introducing a colour into a grey. So a grey became green and so on, which was really interesting. But when these random pieces of paper with the oil paint on them were looked at, they in fact became paintings. They became very interesting pictures. And I, I often thought there was a, 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 an artist called Nicholas de Stile, and they, be, they began to look like his work, right? So that was all remembered. In the, in the sculpture week, we had to make things 
that couldn't be made out of particular material. Like we had to make rigid structures out of plaster. I remember very much. Uh, where you could cut shapes out of plaster and fit them together so to make a very strong, rigid structure out of something that was very fragile. Uh, uh, it, it didn't work, but, but it, this was, brings, brings the call, technology and constructivism was implied there. Right? So you weren't making a sculpture of something, you were making a sculpture that was self-supporting in a very strange way, an unnatural way, anti-gravity as it were. And, and things like stability and like a pyramid, for example, would be considered boring, right? Whereas an inverted pyramid would become, it would work, it would become interesting and dynamic was a word that was used a lot. It had to be, have this kind of dyna, dynamism. And, yeah. and this that yeah the, the staff were uh, I think largely as perplexed as the students were because <laughs> there was only at that time Harry Thubron who seemed to have the how shall I say secret knowledge of what was supposed to be going on the other staff usually returnees from the second world war returning to school right, returning to art school as staff were you know, they didn't understand what was going on. We so quickly understood because we knew what was wanted. We wanted the dynamism. We wanted unusual, uh, nothing normal, nothing banal, nothing, anything but that, right? And uh, strangely enough, what started to happen was people, students, started using unusual materials. Uh, usually, you know, this is the beginning of what I call skip art, where you found things in skips or, or some, using something unusual and started working on it as a piece of art. And that, and that and then involved collage of unrelated materials and so on. And, and, and after a while, all this became quite natural and quite normal and usual, it become just a, a way of working. So, however it was inculcated in students, wasn't in some kind of predetermined way. It just happened to some more than others, but it, uh, to, to all to a greater or lesser degree. Yeah. Jeff, my, un my sort of understanding is that the, the, the basic design course that was being taught at Leeds was that there was a version of it also being developed at, at Newcastle at the same time. But outside yeah. of those two centres, what would have been happening at the at, at um, other art schools in the country? Would it have been radically different at that point? Well, yeah, it, it was because but I have, I think it's necessary to explain to uh, colleagues that participate in the, what the British art school system was like prior to uh, the innovation of the basic design course, as it became known. Uh, it was all run to a, a art education was conducted according to a national curriculum that all art schools did, right? Which geographically, it didn't matter. Everybody did the same thing nationally. Uh, and the award was called the National Diploma in Design. And with an examination, four years, with an ex examination halfway after the second year, called the intermediate. And the basic design course was the first year of the, at Leeds, Newcastle, Cardiff and Leicester were the only places who did it, right? It was introduced in the first year of the intermediate year. The, that is the very first year of four years, right? The other students were, uh, I don't know what they were doing because I never experienced it. In the, in the other institutions that weren't doing the basic design courses that became known. Uh, I suppose they were just uh, charcoal drawing, life drawing, uh, composition, picture making, and so on. And, and, and there was a still part of that at Leeds because we had to do a subsidiary subject as well as the basic design course. 
which and that work was examined at the end of year two by sending it off to a centre in London. And then they came back and said, well done or not. And, and interestingly, the year before I, I went, Harry Thubron, when he was introducing the basic design course, all the work was sent to London and came back as failed. The whole year failed the national examination because they weren't doing the curriculum. They were doing this new, innovative, what were the words? Um, experimental, dynamic kind of activity. But that wasn't recognised. But it very soon became recognised because it eventually led to the Summerson Committee, which was a national revision of art and design education in, your, in Britain nationally. And that got away with the old system of the NDAD and introduced the DIPAD, Diploma in Art and Design, which was considered to be at degree level, right? But as an, a condition of the... Uh, the dog, <laughs> postman. <laughs> So all right, Matt, I don't want uh, a condition of the uh, uh, <laughs> the pay D structure was that students had to do a foundation year, either at their own unit, uh, own art school or a, or a local one, a different one. So all students were doing a similar structure to national art and design education, but they could interpret what they did. Each institution could interpret its delivery its own way because it wasn't responsible to this Ministry of Education or whatever it was. Jeff, going back, to what, going back to what you described as the, uh, as the syllabus and the curriculum on the basic design mm. course, and then sort of thinking about what the difference might be in other art schools, is it fair to say that there was a sort of emphasis on abstraction and moving away from figuration in relation yeah. to the teaching? Yeah. yeah. Well, they, went, they were side by sides, actually, Sean, because a lot of the teaching was based around drawing. Figure drawing had to be done because it was part of the requirement for the examination. But it was sent off to the, in the intermediate exam. The ex, you know, these people wanted figurative drawing. So there was a lot of drawing, intense drawing, but it was a different approach to drawing. Like, for example, life drawing, the figure, the models moved about. They didn't stand still. You had to do this kind of drawing something moving, human forms moving, not, not standing very, very still and being drawn. Uh, and I suppose that's what the others were doing. I don't know. But the DIPAD changed all that, as I, as I said. And eventually the DIPAD became incorporated into polytechnics. Some of it, some of it was abandoned because not all courses were incorporated in the polytechnics and then the polytechnics became universities and that's the condition we have now where art and design is done in universities mm -hmm. right as you well know but yes and could you describe a little bit the content of the contextual studies program that you that you yeah. studied, that, that supported the basic design course i mean was it an inline art history or, or how did it support the course well, your colleagues, uh, uh, both colleagues speakers earlier for myself and yourself have mentioned architecture and the, how shall I call it, um, contemporary studies or liberal studies, right? It wasn't art historical based. It was based, it was taught by Norbert Linton, who was a German in originally, a German refugee from uh, the war, pre-war. Uh, and he, he, he was in the School of Architecture and he taught, he, he was the person who introduced us to names like Lysitsky, Marovic, Rodchenko, Tatlin, Gropius, Van Duisburg, Kandinsky, Mondrian, he, which are all, is a sense, abstract, none of, the, none of that lot being figurative artists. They were all abstract, and in fact, the steel ins insisted on 
no figuration at all, the Dutch school, right? It was, uh, well, Mondrian, for example. If you think of Mondrian, and sp that space division and color arrangements. So there was, there was no art history as art history might be understood now. You know, like that kind of Gombrich, the story of art, linear historical progression from one style to another in Europe. No, it was the, and so all that became involved in. And the other interesting thing around that was the work of, well, let me just get his, my piece of paper. Somebody called Anton Ehrensweig, mm -hmm. uh, who was an Austrian psychoanalyst, right? Who uh, was interested in Gestalt theory, and uh, and this and, and and he believed that creativeness was fed from very deep levels of the mind, and he set up a course at Goldsmiths College around teaching art that was uh, established to teach people who wanted to be teachers of art in schools, right? And he also said something interesting, and, and that sort of added to the kind of liberal studies dimension. He, did, he, he visited Leeds on two occasions, and we all found it very difficult to understand this psychoanalytical aspect of, of creativity as he presented it. But that, that's, just, that's the kind of thing that was introduced rather than the art history lesson. Yeah. It's interesting that you were saying that a lot of, the, a lot of staff had come back from the, from the army and, and, and Thubron was the one who sort of understood everything and had the secret. <laughs> but my understanding, that as well as Thubron, that the, the, the there were a series of quite well-known artists who were the Gregory Fellows at Leeds University. Who were that's already... right, yeah. Yeah. Could you talk about those a little bit? Yeah, sure. The, um, the University of Leeds, which was a totally separate institution to the art school, right? Uh, uh, under, the, under somebody called Gregory, a foundation that was a bequest to the University of Leeds, they could offer artists of distinction a two-year fellowship to work in the university, right? And uh, there was one, one, one of the fellowships was in painting, one was in sculpture, and one was in poetry, strangely. And I think that was a, I think Sir Herbert Reed uh, was influential in promoting that and deciding who achieved the fellowship or was awarded it. But all those people, all of them, uh, when I were there, uh, played a part in the education at Leeds College of Art as visiting artists. Uh, Terry Frost, Patrick Heron, Trevor Bell, Alan Davey, uh, Wendy, Victor Passmore, Hubert Dollwood, and so on. They all, they all came and mixed in with the students. They didn't just come and give a lecture, they hung about the place. I think they found it more interesting than the university because they were artists and this was an art school. And a, and a very interesting art school, since since it was so different, yeah. And this was just because Harry Thubran had, had contacts with them and knew them. They weren't. Yeah, Harry Thubran was very uh, astute at making contacts with people, and working with people, and because the uh, Leeds College of Art at that time came under the aegis of the Leeds City Leeds Council, Leeds the local authority, Leeds City Council funded it, managed it, provided accommodation and the money. He was very, he became very close to the um, director of education, uh, a man called John Taylor, and therefore the, uh, and Sir Herbert Reid, and the, the how shall I say, the, the education authority had a very, very benign, attitude towards the art school. They found it really interesting what was going on and supported it rather than tried to close it. Right? So it was, Harry was good at that, yeah. Mm. Um, maybe it'd be interesting to bring Doug in as well, because 
Doug was the foundation oh, yeah. student at, mm. uh, at, oh, Leeds, yeah. at Leeds College of Arts 50 years after you, Jeff, in, in, in yeah. 2010. Um, so you were there in, in 1960 and, and Doug was there in 2010. Yeah. Uh, so I'd be interested to maybe understand what, what Doug remembers about the programme in relation to the sort of ethos of foundation and the pro projects that you understood or, or undertook there, Doug. Yeah, um, embarrassingly, I think, uh, I can't remember as much as Jeff, <laughs> even though I did it 10 years ago and Jeff did it 50 years ago. Your, Jeff, your memory is way better than mine. <laughs> um, 60 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> 60 years ago. Um, yeah, so I I did the the foundation at Leeds College of Art, as it was called mm. then. Um, I did A levels before that, which just to kind of contextualize, I guess my art education before um, the A level system at school or six forms, six form colleges, are quite academic, um, quite sort of. Uh, maybe not like academic drawing and stuff like this, but things were based around like, maybe because of the facilities and uh, time and equipment and things like this, it was just life drawing, uh, a lot of self portraits, um, nothing particularly like radical or something. Um, Seems to have regressed. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Um, so coming to foundation, uh, I remember thinking of even just what I knew like drawing to be like, uh, I remember one of the first drawing projects we, um, uh, we came into this big open studio space, um, and there was this crazy Phila esque kind of wooden structure that was just this monumental uh, sculpture um, and it had like bits of tape that kind of punctuated the sculpture it had like plumb lines down it um, and we had to just sort of draw this mess of wood basically mm. um, and I just remember I was I was just kind of mind blown of, of, uh, of, of like what, what, we, what we were being asked to sort of do. Um, another thing that was kind of interesting was, is that, you know, at school you've got like one hour lessons or two hour lessons or something like this. Um, I was quite surprised at the, the sort of freedom and the sorts of parity of the student tutor relationship of, um, it was much more kind of relaxed. There was much more of a sort of community, I guess, kind of like what you were saying before, Jeff, about like, you know, Victor Passmore and people would maybe just be kind of hanging around. There was kind yeah. of this sort of, uh, um, I don't know, like mutual learning going on and happening. Um, so yeah, the sort of studying art five days a week it sort of became very, very quickly more um, professionalized or something, maybe it's like a sort of, like as yeah. in, you know, you were, it wasn't just a session, it wasn't just a one hour lesson of life drawing or something, it became this, you know, day job in a way um, of, le of learning. Um, and similarly to what you'd said about the basic design course um, of that kind of cleansing. I remember in the beginnings of the course, there was a there was talk about unlearning the kind of mm. bad <laughs> education previously. And you yeah. know, sort of it was about, I guess, what foundation is of rebuilding or like building this sort of like new um, structure of like how to learn. Um, I guess as well, very, very differently from the previous art education was that you had to sort of 
play much more and develop much more of a of a like a final outcome. You kind of um, you tested, you developed, you refined um, to a, a, a final result, and you kind of ended with a. You you didn't have to begin with an idea. You had to just begin with a problem to solve, and that was that was very different. No. Um, and would you have been aware of Barhouse for Kutmas at, at that point, Doug, or not? For Kutmas, definitely not, because I I learned about that probably about two years ago when I moved to Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I didn't know about the Kutmas. Um, Bauhaus, I definitely heard of Bauhaus, um, but probably just knew it more as a of like a surface understanding of that it was a, a post-war German art school that was seen to to be like very radical. That's that's all I sort of knew. I didn't know the kind of ins and outs of what happened there or anything. And what, what about Leeds College of Art itself? Were you aware of the, the history of art education there? Did you feel part of a sort of legacy or not? Um, I think I remember um, like applying to, to do the foundation. I did apply for, to other local foundation programmes because I knew about how competitive the Leeds Foundation was. Um, I knew that it had a history and that there was, uh, you know, probably like a lot of art schools, they like to, to tell you who their um, alumni are and things like this. So I, I didn't know of an, a kind of legacy, I guess, but not, yeah, not to, a, to like a, a huge extent. Um, I think in terms of feeling kind of part of the legacy, I think, throughout the course of um, meeting ex-students, like there was um, Alex Farah, who was studying in Leeds, uh, came and did a, a project um, within the art school. And sort of from talking to him, uh, talking to, I guess, like other kind of ex-students that he was friends with, and also going on to trips to like, Glasgow and Edinburgh, where you also met ex lead students, you started to, yeah, I guess, get some kind of understanding of that it's sort of a, a club or something, I guess. It's sort of a, <laughs> the, you know, you kind of, um, it's like an invisible badge, I guess, <laughs> in a way. Um, and I think that kind of, it's quite interesting then of still now of meeting people that did do the Leeds Foundation course um, in London or wherever, wherever else. It's kind of, there is a, a sort of uh, understanding of that kind of legacy, I think, yeah. John, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask you, you're, you're a big part of the, uh, well, foundation course. You taught there for over 23 years. I think from 1994 to 2017 prior and after you you came to lead the course here in Moscow so you know hearing what Jeff was saying about the uh, basic course that was uh, established by Thabron uh, and uh, you know after those 30 years that Jeff actually left the school do you think um, there were clear kind of links and traces was anything actually left from that time till when you were teaching? Um, we, we were certainly, we studied in the same building. So I, I, I was teaching in the same building that Jeff was a student in, which is a building called Vernon Street in Leeds and was the original art school building. So the art school had grown and, and the degree courses by then had moved to another site in Blenheim, but the foundation course was still on the original, and still is actually on the, in the original site in, in Vernon Street. So there were certainly things around the building um, that, and Doug was talking about um, Alex Farah's project. So Alex was uncovering in this project um, all the works that, that were often in art schools. We, we paint things out with white paint every year yeah. uh, or gray paint on the floor. Archaeology. Bury things. So, so um, 
Alex was trying to sort of excavate some of those in the project that, that he'd done by talking to, uh, I think Jeff was one of the people that, uh, that Alex interviewed about trying to sort of uncover not only stories, but where works of art were potentially buried on, it, within the, the walls of white paint or, or, or grey paint mm. on the floors. So certainly that was there. We were teaching the, in the same building. And when I first arrived, the head of foundation um, was a man, a lovely man called Derek Page. And Derek, I believe, he might not have been the same year as Jeff, but was, was certainly a student when Jeff was a student mm. under Harry Thubron as well. So, so Derek had been taught by Harry Thubron on, mm. on the basic course. So, the, so in that sense, there was still, when I arrived, there was still that sort of lineage. And, and I should perhaps say, and, and Jeff might talk about this later, but the, but the, the course split when the, when the Polytechnic was formed in 1970, the, the course at Leeds split and half of the staff went to the new Polytechnic to run the degree course or degree courses and half of them stayed in what then became an FE college. Even though that FE college only taught art and design, it then became Jacob Kramer College. So there was, so, so Jeff was one of the staff who'd been there and had taught, sorry, Derek Page rather was one of the staff who'd, who'd taught with Jeff and Jeff had gone to the new Polytechnic and Derek had stayed at what then became Jacob Kramer. So eventually it became Leeds College of Art again. So at that point, certainly there, there was a link through. And I remember my, my first sort of weeks teaching where I'd been told, you know, you're gonna be making these drawings and say, and then you receive these, these drawings from somebody else's class and you would process them. You'd be processing these drawings. It was a real Leeds term. And I, was, I remember thinking, What's he, what we're we doing then? What we're we processing these drawings? What, What's going on here? So I understood how to get students to make certain drawings, but the fact you were just going to receive these drawings from somebody else's class and you were going to, and it became a real Leeds term, this idea of sort of processing drawings or processing somebody else's work. So certainly when I arrived, that, that sort of um, legacy was, was certainly happening. Uh, what, you know, how much, I mean, it's since changed its name again and is now Leeds Arts University, Jeff, is that right? Yeah. So Leeds you know, University of the Arts, or Leeds Arts University, yeah. Yeah. So whilst everybody else, while, while all the big universities, uh, they're claiming their faculties as arts as art school again. So Manchester, yeah. Manchester Metropolitan University is Manchester School of Art and yeah. Bath Spa University is Bath School of Art. Mm. Le Leeds College of Art has now become Leeds Arts University and it's desperate to become yeah. university, so. Yeah, I did try, oh, so, yeah. Sean, I also wanted to ask as a course leader for foundation, what, um, what do you consider to be the defining features of the foundation education? Um, I guess, Trying to help students, I mean, Doug's talked about this a little bit and Jeff, so I, I guess that they, they've sort of touched on this, but I really think, I guess, helping students to be able to, to move into a different mindset, to move beyond, beyond their preconceptions of what, of what they perhaps thought art and design was before they arrived at art school. And, and, and I think foundation tries to sort of establish the conditions for that to to be able to happen um i think it's a sort of a balance between experimentation invention but also understanding the importance of sort of developing the appropriate level of craft skills to 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 realize ideas and i guess it's about challenging challenging popular myths such as inspiration and waiting for inspiration and again I think Doug touched on this a little bit that maybe maybe ultimately it's about understanding that you arrive at ideas rather than you begin with ideas you do things and you start to understand where an idea might be occurring rather than sitting there with an idea that you've got in your head that you that you're trying to make I, th I, I think certainly that's what we try to do on foundation now but I think from what Doug and Jeff have talked about, I think that's sort of good. Maybe that's part of the lineage of, of, the, of the course, really. 
I, re I remember the kind of the feeling and sort of almost frustration as well of you would because it was only these one week quite intense projects you'd you'd have uh not enough time to then you like learn a lot in that one week and you sort of finish something but the finished thing you kind of want to you know you want a little bit more time to go on to the next thing so as a, as a student it was quite it was challenging in the you know like a level or something or other sort of maybe more kind of prescriptive course you you know what the end goal is and you can kind of plan for the end goal but when you don't know what the end goal is and you uh you arrive at something and then you're excited by that arrival and then you move on to another project it's like oh my god i, just, I wish i could <laughs> just have a like another week or something to just play with these ideas so it's quite i wanted to sort of ask Ksenia, bring Ksenia in now because uh Ksenia, you, you were a, you were a student on the on the foundation course at british high school of art and design in moscow two years ago but you'd previously studied on in the russian state art and design program before that and i wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, how the how the course at, at Botanka differed from the um, the state art and design programs, and perhaps what you got from that. Yes, of course, uh, you were right. I was able to fully feel the difference in the educational process uh, since I had already a Russian higher education at the classical art university before entering to British High School of Art and Design. Uh, I studied for five years at my first university, then I worked uh, as a graphic designer several years, and uh, unfortunately I had a creative crisis because despite uh, the fact uh, that I had theoretical knowledge, uh, I felt that I couldn't uh, think broadly. Uh, my view of uh, things wasn't flexible and my imagination was uh, driven into many frames. Um, and I understood that I needed to do something, I needed to change that. Um, I felt uh, it should be another way of thinking, uh, which is why I chose the British um, High School of Art and Design and uh, especially its foundation course. Uh, I had uh, no idea what was coming. I just knew it would be a different approach. It was more difficult for me to perceive uh, what was uh, happening because uh, I had something to compare it with. Uh, and for example, a student uh, who went straight to college after school uh, didn't have any templates for what university should look like. Uh, as for me, I had a constant uh, internal struggle uh, because I'm used to getting information. I'm used to being given one and uh, a half uh, hour lectures. Uh, and most importantly, I'm uh, used to the fact that um, tasks uh, were uh, uh, the tasks were always uh, clear and specific and uh, tutors told me what to do. Um, and now after a while I can fully form my opinion uh, about the foundation course uh, and um, it was difficult and different by 180 degrees, uh, but uh, it was awesome definitely. Uh, so, um, what uh, it is a basic course in Britannica. Uh, this is uh, a huge schoolroom, an open space. Uh, there are no subjects, no lectures. Uh, there are tasks from um, which students uh, get the necessary knowledge and make uh, independent conclusions. Uh, in other words, um, students uh, form their opinion of space, subject, material, and uh, interaction through an analysis. Um, 
during their studies, uh, students get uh, a new brief uh, at the beginning of the week. Uh, and believe me, uh, like um, uh, Doug said, that no one knows what they will get at the end of the week. Uh, so the result is not as important as the process of thinking. In the first month of studies on the first tape, students complete general tasks from all areas of design, which will later help them decide in which uh, direction they want to develop further. For example, this month uh, helped me a lot because I initially planned to apply my knowledge in communication design but uh, unexpectedly I chose a product design direction, direction. and um, I think that it was um, uh, the right choice uh, because now I uh, felt myself, uh, now I feel myself in the right place. Um, by the way, the tutors in foundation course are also different. Uh, they act as a mentors uh, for, for the first time, um, I saw a personalized approach to each student. Tutors talk to them a lot, help them with advice when they don't know how to develop the project further, tell them how to do their best as an opinion. All tutors are current practitioners and their knowledge are based not only on the read and heard information, but first of all, on personal experience. Uh, I would also like to add a few words about the availability of workshops in the college. All of them are equipped with tools and everyone can test their idea. Uh, this possibility helps uh, the idea to remain not only on a piece of paper, but also to test its uh, viability. So foundation course helped me to realize that if you generally understand how objects interact with space, light and color, how materials work, you can really be a designer without any specific direction. This realization finally gave me freedom of thoughts. Uh, and I guess in my description of the foundation course, it is uh, already noticeable that um, uh, there are many um same things in an educational process uh, between british high school of art and design and of Kutemas. and um i want uh, i will be happy if uh, uh, russian educational institutions begin to return to this format of education uh, and at least to allow this to happen so could you just see the images on the screen there? Yeah, this the, is the, the, that was that was Ksenia's final project on on the uh, on foundation. So that was that was the final work that Ksenia made at the, at the end of the course. Um, thank you, Ksenia. That was great, Misha. Uh, I, I thought that maybe one of the other sort of interesting parallels in relation to sort of all the the things that we've been talking about. So we've the sort of parallels between me and Jeff in terms of Leeds and, and Doug and Jeff in, in relation to Doug being a foundation student and then Ksenia being a foundation student in Moscow. But it sort of suddenly we realized the other day that um, after studying at Leeds College of Art, Jeff went on to study at the Slade. Uh, and Misha, you studied at the Slade from 2003 to 2007, which was 40 years after, after Jeff was at the Slade. And uh, Phila de Barlow, at, at the point that you were studying there, she was the professor of fine art and the head of undergraduate studies. And uh, Philida and Jeff were, I believe, um, you studied on in the same year at, at, at the Slade, Jeff, is that right? Sorry, Philida Barlow. You and Philida studied in the same yeah. year. So, so yeah. again, it's quite interesting, the sort of connection. Oh, yeah. Between, between you know, the, these things. Oh, yeah. The world's yeah. a small place. Indeed. And uh, like, like Ksenia, Misha, you, you decided to undertake a, a UK sort of art education. Ksenia did that in Moscow through the British High School of Art and Design. Um, you, you moved to the UK to do that. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you came to make that decision. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, 
I've tried to study at the Russian state universities. Uh, I've um, thought about applying to Surikov Institute and then to Stroganov Academy. And I did some uh, preparation courses there. And I've just realized when uh, I was finishing school and was thinking of joining university that I wouldn't be able to cope with the level of restriction, with the level of uh, kind of narrowness of education and the fact that, you know, uh, it was very difficult to express your own, uh, you know, vision, your own personality. Uh, you know, students had to follow very, very restricted, uh, you know, scheme of uh, uh, studies. A very specific way of, uh, you know, visualizing, a very academic way of drawing, and so on. And luckily, I had that opportunity to to go abroad and uh, to study in UK. And uh, I was very um, happy that I got accepted to the Slate. At first, I was actually shocked, of course. Uh, with the amount of freedom, with the amount of, uh, you know, with, with the structure itself, that, you know, there weren't like timetabled classes where, you know, you know, at 10 o'clock you have to be drawing, at 12 o'clock you have to be doing composition, at uh, 2 o'clock you have to practice. So, so it was more about this community, as Duff was uh, mentioning and Jeff, and uh, uh, it was a great... Uh, time uh, where I was able to exchange again vision ideas my cultural background and uh, it was a great kind of school of life actually and uh, I've I've managed to through the the years I studied as I've managed to understand the importance of that choice that I made and uh, the fact that it was a right choice for me and actually after I finished I, I you know, during my studies, I never thought that I wanna, I wanna, I wanna teach. I thought that it was uh, one of the worst professions possible. But uh, uh, later on, I, I thought that uh, I realized that I really want to share this experience, and I thought that I want somehow to bring that back to to Moscow. And uh, I, you know, when I was doing my postgrad at the Royal Drawing School, I saw the advert about the British High School of Art and Design, and it was partly one of the decisions I decided to come back from London to Moscow because I realized that there is a kind of British education-based school uh, now being established, and it's it's definitely a, pl a place where I can possibly share what I've learned. Thank you. Yeah, maybe Aliona want to add something because she also uh, was a student and then later on taught at the at the school here. Yeah, I have also an interesting comment on top of what uh, Ksenia and Mikhail uh, said because uh, first of all, I also graduated from a state uh, art university in Moscow. Then I was uh, studying at CPD course in Britanka, so I can compare it a little bit from a student perspective. But then I also was teaching on a BA course in Britanka and uh, in, uh, in parallel in several state universities. So I can compare it from uh, my experience of interaction with students. And uh, one of the most important things that I think now foundation course has uh, in common with um, spirit of Hutemas is that uh, from the very beginning, the emphasis is on ideas, not on the execution of the projects. It's a very important thing that many contemporary academics from um, um, Russian state universities can't not understand. They come to the, for example, uh, foundation exhibition and they criticize the execution of the project. But the problem is that uh, uh, within their approaches in uh, state universities, when you first have a very, very strong emphasis on techniques, that you need to learn the right techniques for, for example, doing stitches or uh, making a paper models, so you have to skill it perfectly. But in the end, they kill the original creativity that students have. When they come from the school, quite often very, very full of creative ideas. Um, 
but uh, through the six years of education, when, for example, I consulted um, graduation projects in a state university, you try to show to the student a variety of opportunities they have, and they looking at you, waiting for you to suggest the only one right answer. That they are not after six years at the state universities. Often they are not ready to and to, to face the idea that there is not a singular right answer and that they have to choose for themselves to make these lines of decisions and conclusions that would lead them to their own um, right outcome. The, that will be suited to their situation. And um, so um, this, um, and from for the mass, we can all, all also see lots of um, students uh, drawings that are left and they look unfinished they look fresh they look like somebody just to uh, walk through and drew a doodle and to uh, uh, went away but that's what the whole idea behind it also um, the first director of uh, Fotomas Yefim Ravdil uh, before uh, he was a young um, experimental sculptor and theater designer and before he moved to Moscow he was uh, heading Swomas free state art uh, uh, workshop in another small city outside of Moscow. And one of the academical professors from there, he described the terrible amount of freedom that Ravdil gave to his students. For example, he entered a painting class and instead of a still life painting, they took all the things they could find, banded them together and then one on a rope, hang it on a rope. And then one student was moving this rope from one side of the class to another. And other students have to draw it and they call it still lives and dynamics. <laughs> and that's what <laughs> this, it sounded crazy for them, but that was a kind of a breakthrough that they needed to, to uh, allow in order to come to completely new, um, results. And also maybe another uh, two small things uh, to mention in order to compare Futamas with the foundation course and also with Bauhaus is the late of the course that in um, Futamas originally it was one year, uh, then from uh, 2023 to, to so till 2026 it was two years course and then all, all once again one year and before the closer closure of the Futamas a half of the year. Uh, but uh, when they did it one year, the second year still uh, stayed, but it was uh, more closely connected with um, specific departments. So the same teachers continued doing uh, propedeutics, but more project uh, oriented. So then if you were doing textiles, you would experiment more with uh, compositions, uh, color compositions on uh, plane. If you were doing architecture or furniture, you will be uh, focusing more on um, uh, space and volume. So, um, and um, nowadays we know that uh, uh, the, at, by the end of the foundation, they also come uh, up with a project that are more connected uh, with a particular direction. I think Sean can correct me on that and add on top of that, but uh, that's because uh, the current, current uh, time of education uh, is narrowed and we need to, to get through many processes more quickly. So it's a natural thing, I guess. But interesting thing is that uh, within Futamas um, Propedeutic uh, course, there was initiative held majorly by Lubov Popova and supported by Alexander Rochenko, Anton Lavinsky, and uh, Alexander Besnin. Uh, they wanted, based on um, this preliminary course, uh, make a practical workshop. So all the abstract compositions they did, they could be later uh, connected to exact tax, tasks in graphic design and fashion in theater. They actually wanted to collaborate with real institutions. And so after the first year of uh, preliminary course, uh, give uh, students uh, real uh, tasks from real life and Popova even wrote a program on graphic design that exists in archive. It was rejected by Favorsky, Vladimir Favorsky, and it all never happened. But they also tried to build this uh, direct link to the practice inside the preliminary course. And it's great now that in Britannica it exists. <laughs> well, if, if nobody else wants to add anything else, I'm gonna... Mm, just to make a conclusion, um, I think. Uh, unless, it's, panel, unless the attendee have got anything they want to put in the question and answers uh, in the Q and A session, Nisha, is all I was thinking. Yes, yes. There's there's a chance. 
if there is uh, any questions, it can be asked. But I just wanted to add that, uh, again, this year we're celebrating the centenarium, yeah? And 100 years ago, we saw, and today we talked about those great experimental approaches. And I really hope that, uh, you know, generally, especially here in Russia, the uh, beginning of the professional art and design education are going to be reviewed and uh, actually the attention is going to be turned to those great, uh, very exciting and uh, very brave approaches that were happening, were established a century ago. And uh, very soon we're going to join next year. So it's going to be 101 year after the Hutuma. So hopefully that's going to be a new beginning of a new history and uh, for new discoveries. And uh, by the help of my great colleagues, uh, I really hope we're going to be part of that. And uh, we're going to see uh, a new era and uh, a new breakout, I guess. Uh, there's a question, I think. Bob Richmond is asking, uh, he's, he's actually saying that he knew Harry Thurmbon very well. Uh, and he's yes. saying that he would like to talk to you, Sean and Jeffrey, and also make contacts with you in Moscow. Yeah, Bob, thank you for the comment. I'm sure, Sean. Bob, I, I, I think that, um... Maybe my friend Anna Wilkinson uh, is is a common link, so maybe I can I can send my uh, contact details on, and we and we can make contact if you want to talk. and uh, And I guess if uh, if if Jeff doesn't mind me sending his uh, his email on, I can I can I can send that on, and you can make contact with with Jeff then as well. Is that yeah. okay? Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that, Bob. Great. Well. Thank you all so much. I think it was uh, great to hear you speaking, talking about our theme today. And uh, uh, thank you for taking your time. And uh, hopefully, maybe in a few years, we're going to get together and uh, see the new perspectives and comment on what's going to be happening in the art and, art and design education in the coming years. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you. Talk to you all. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. bye.